ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Out There Hour. It's nice, it's warm, it's cuddly. Give us a cuddle. The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! Yay! In your face, everybody else. Good morning, Kuwait. <laughs> Good morning, Kuwait. <laughs> and the Middle East. <laughs> Good morning, the Middle East generally. Good morning, Israel. We've got a lot of people on from Israel. Yeah. It's very strange. It's going to be a great show today. We've got a fantastic show today with a top guest, world-renowned guest. We don't get to say that often. No, not too often. Who is he? What's he up to? What does he do? Tell us everything, Basil. You know all. His name is Jonathan Downs. Yes. He's a cryptozoologist. What's a cryptozoologist? A cryptozoologist is somebody who investigates mysterious animals. I imagine that's the crypto part. That's the crypto part. And it could be something like uh, it could be something like Bigfoot, Chupacabra, the Loch Ness Monster. Yes. Um, some other weird stuff you might have heard of, like a Mothman. Ooh. I didn't and, know that was actually and, uh, a real thing. An Owlman. Oh man, I want to ask him about well, that. Moth- I only heard of that today. Mothman is a is a a, a, a man sized moth creature who has been reported all over the world. Ah. We'll have to ask him about that. He's a cryptozoologist. He's an yep. author. He's a filmmaker. He's a journalist. He's written a lot of books, hasn't he? Composer, singer, songwriter, with a background in radical politics and mental health care. Not I, surprised. I read that and thought, what <laughs> does that mean? Well, he's got a background in mental health. He's worked with the mentally ill. Yeah. Uh, background in radical politics, how does that tie in with cryptozoology? We'll have to ask him. We'll have to find out. Yeah. Um, oh, his um, his father was an explorer and a colonial service officer. Ah. Uh, who author, he authored several books on a wide range of subjects. He's so, lived in um, Nigeria as well, I think, in Hong Kong. And he's lived other. in Nigeria. He was brought up in Nigeria and Hong Kong on, oh. on account of his father being a... I wonder if he's got any chests of gold. I'm sure he hasn't. If we give him $2,000, maybe he'll send them over. He, would, he wouldn't be on this program if he had. <laughs> yeah, so the father was a, an author. Yes. And he, he wrote books on African history, theology, and the Devonshire dialect, which probably needs a bit of examination. Blimey. If you've ever spoken to anybody from Devonshire. Aye. Uh, his mother, Mary Downs, was a broadcaster and author who published several collections of Nigerian folklore. Ah. Now, Jonathan himself is currently yeah. the editor of Animals and Men. Yep. The journal of the, the journal of the Center of Fortean Zoology. Yeah. The ed- the editor the of editor, the yeah. amateur naturalist, not naturist, naturalist. Yeah. Yep. Formerly exotic pets. He's the director of the Center for Fortean Zoology as well. That's right, and a magazine published by C F Z uh, Press. Yep. Um, the online was the online ma- uh, magazine blog Cryptozoology Online. Yeah. Now, I mean, he's got a website as well. Now, if I can remember it correctly, see if you can remember it. Um, I think it's um, cfz.org.uk. I'll have to actually get that back from him. I'm not sure exactly what that website is. Oh, he, he worked as a psychiatric nurse between 1981 and 1990 and 1990 and 94. Uh-huh. So that's his uh, ties with uh, the... Uh, right. Yeah, but yeah it, the, his website is cfz dot org dot uk i can come now i can now confirm and you can join it's not uh, it's not a spectator sport you can actually join in and he was also ran the the fan club for steve Har- harley and the cockney rebels did he really somebody he's had got to. it all he, somebody had to hey eh? he's eh? got it all yeah. he's broken oh, he's every got, rule he's broken every rule yeah oh, that was brilliant Mark. come well, on now seriously that was excellent. not often do i know the lyrics to songs you know that one. Who doesn't know the lyrics to that one? An all-time favourite. Yeah, exactly. And he also covered Here Comes the Sun's Son, Steve Harley, not Jonathan. Yeah, well, we'll probably brush over that. So, shall we get him on? Uh, let's go for it. Let's I think call him. I, I can't say much more about him. He's a very interesting guy, and we're yep. going to ask him a few things. We're going to ask him about his involvement uh, in America in the Sci-Fi Channel, uh, tracking down Tuba Capra. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Right, let's give him a call then. Uh, where are we? Hello. Hello, Jonathan Downs. Hi, how are you? Oh, not too bad, not too bad. Um, <clears throat> this is Mark speaking. And this is Basil. Jonathan, how are you? Oh, not too bad, guys, not too bad. It's, what can I do for you It's today? wonderful to speak to you today. I'm a great fan. Thank you. Of your work. It's all very interesting stuff. Basil was just giving uh, your uh, credits and your intro and things then, and uh, even that sounded quite interesting and intriguing. Golly. So... 
How You're going to does... give me a swollen head like that? Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how, how would somebody go about going from being a, a mental health professional to a cryptozoologist? That was my question just while we were talking about you. Uh, the honest truth is I had a massive nervous breakdown oh. after 10 years working with um, working in mental health. Right. I went spectacularly mad and there wasn't anything else I knew how to do. Wow. That's a brilliant answer. Not many people well, start their answer spent, with, I went completely mad. <laughs> well, I spent, I spent 12 years doing what I knew was a socially valid and important thing that I, that I, needed, I needed to do, but I didn't yeah. enjoy it at all. No. And then basically, when I found myself redundant, uh, redundant and... Uh, quite unwell at the age of 30 i decided to spend the rest of my life doing what i actually enjoyed doing. yeah yeah absolutely good, good advice to anybody i think indeed i think so H how did you come back from the nervous breakdown uh, jonathan i mean how did you uh, come right again oh uh, well some people would say i'm not right now <laughs> um, years of therapy years of therapy and well, it was just a not very nice, not a very nice period of my life. Yeah, know. yeah. I've I've been through it. I've got the I've come out the other side. It it sounds like you were. I think it sounds like getting back into doing things that you enjoy and that you like doing was probably a uh, part of it. Well, yeah, and much to my surprise, I found I actually found that I'm actually quite good at it. I'm actually quite good at being a cryptozoologist. It's probably yeah. better at being. As well, just and I was being a mental health nurse, so mm. it's just the way the world works out. Sometimes I think most people are probably better at their hobbies than at their work because yeah. you'd be more interested in your hobby anyway, wouldn't you? Well, you elected to uh, to do it. You're not forced into yeah. doing it like most people That's are with work, I imagine. Yeah. So cryptozoology for all the people out there who have never heard that term, because I must admit I I knew that people studied various unusual animals, but I wasn't aware of the term until relatively recently. So I imagine there's a few other people as well who don't know. Yeah. What is cryptozoology in a in a in a nutshell? In a nutshell, it is the study of animals which are not scientifically accepted, which are not known, not accepted by mainstream science. Right, right. And there are a good few of them, aren't there? There's, there's, we've got a big list of them here that we've just pulled up through, through various uh, your, of your videos and things that you've commented on, and we've got a big list of those that we might ask about later as well. Okay. Um, so how did you um, sort of get involved in cryptozoology then? What, what started your, your journey? Well, um, back in... Oh Lord, 45 years ago, 44 years ago, in the summer of 1968, I was living in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong was then a British colony. And every Thursday, my mother used to go into town to uh, go, um, play tennis with her friends, have coffee, and then she'd go to the library. And she'd bring back, uh, she'd bring back um, thrillers for my father, Color, color, picture books for my little brother and books for animals for me. Ah. And one day she brought back a book called Myth or Monster, which just totally blew me away because I'd always been interested in animals, but I was totally blown away by the idea that there were people who believed that there were monsters in Loch Ness and mm. yetis in yeah. the Himalayas and things. And basically I just fell in love with it. And I went to school the next day, and the, um, the teacher did one of those things that they did in schools in those days. So, class, what are you going to be when you grow up? And uh, Billy, what are you going to be? And Billy said, I'm going to be a soldier, miss. What are you going to be, Freddie? I'm going to be a train driver, miss. What are you going to be, Jonathan? I'm going to be a monster hunter. <laughs> Back of the class, Jonathan. Up. And then she was a terrifying woman. Terrifying woman. <laughs> and I thought she was ancient. She was probably in her mid-40s. I thought she was ancient. <laughs> um, she was a terrifying woman. She uh, got reared up to her full height and said, Mr. Downs, who are never going to amount to anything if you don't know your nine times table. <laughs> and that's basically the story of how I did it. I thought, then, right, screw you, I'm going to well, do this anyway. You, you, and that's basically why I did. You, you'd think they'd be used to uh, strange creatures in Japan with Godzilla and everything, wouldn't you, Jonathan? Japan? Japan. Oh, oh sorry, were, were, you, uh, were you brought up in Japan and Africa, I thought I read? Hong Kong. Oh, Hong, oh, Hong Kong. Kong. Oh, Hong Kong. I'm oh, so sorry. The British colony. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Ignore Basil, he's a little bit artistic. He provides his own audio sometimes. 
<laughs> so, so sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, but mine, mate. I mean, you know, but no, Hong, Hong Kong's kung fu movies, Japan's Godzilla. Yeah, that, 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 actually, that helps immensely. And now I know exactly oh. what you mean. <laughs> Are you, have you got your associations now? I got, I've got yeah. them. He's cleared that yeah, up yeah, for okay, me quite lovely. nicely. Well, Thank okay, you. We'll not make that one again. Yeah. Uh, so, what uh, do you have? Uh, I assume you've got lots of experience. Well, we know you've got lots of experience. But do you have actual? Is, are there qualifications that one can get in cryptozoology? In a word, no. Right. Which is good because I haven't got them. Handy. Okay. And I, I suppose what? Where have you s- sort of studied this? Then is it all been your own experience and your own self-taught? Well, basically, um, I've been doing this now professionally for over twenty years. Yeah. Was it twenty-two years now? And no, I haven't got a degree. I haven't got a degree. There are no degrees in cryptozoology, and it is. I am basically mm. self-taught. Well, yeah. I imagine it's going to be hard to get a degree in a science that science doesn't agree exists. Yeah, exactly. They're not going to provide you with such a degree anytime soon, are they? I imagine. Well, you never know these days because you can get degrees in all sorts of ridiculous things. That's true. That's true. Yeah, there are. I've seen, I've heard of uh, quite a few ones out there. I've, I've heard of degrees in UFO abduction and things like that. So you never know. Oh. <laughs> uh, speak- well, when my mate Richard went to university to do a degree in zoology, he was appalled to find that there were only four universities in England that actually did the degree he wanted, right. whereas I think there were seven universities did degrees in aromatherapy. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You have to smell to get well. My, my, my goodness, Jonathan, you've written a lot of books. Wow. That's a lot of books. Yeah. Written or edited. Yeah. Uh, There's quite a few there. We have a few here. The uh, one that springs to mind is The Owlman and Others. The Owlman. Yeah. What is The Owlman? Well, that, that was one that leapt out. I've never heard of that Any one. relation to Mothman? Uh, good question. Similar sort of thing, except it's been reported in the Falmouth Bay area of southern Cornwall oh. on and off since 1976. That's right. That but yeah, a similar sort of thing to Mothman. So I've got down here just a couple of notes. These uh, creatures, we'll, we'll call them, they, they've been spotted all over the world at various different types. And I was wondering whether or not you could maybe tell us, first of all, any that you're aware of that are in sort of the UK and Ireland, any, any close ones, and then maybe we'll move out from there to go more, more globally. Well, the stuff that really interests me is things which are real animals, which are not yet to be discovered. Yeah. There's an awful lot of stuff here. There's an awful lot of stuff which people get in, mixed up with cryptozoology, which has nothing to do with cryptozoology at all. The Owlman, for example, it's something I don't like to use the word paranormal because I think these things are perfectly normal. Mm. It's just that they have, where they're defined by laws of science we don't understand yet. But whatever it is, it isn't a flesh and blood animal. Right. Uh, but yes, there are. There are bona fide mystery animals in the United Kingdom, most famous ones probably being the lake monsters in both uh, Britain, uh, both um, the UK and in Ireland, which have been reported from various lakes, uh, oh. most famous being Loch Ness, but yep. there's ones in quite a few Irish lakes and various other ones in Scotland, That's a new even one in me. Lake Windermere in the Lake District. Wow, I didn't know that. I've only ever heard of the Loch Ness one. I didn't know they had them in other uh, locks and, and lakes. Are they a similar report? Are they, do, they, do, they, do they follow the same design? Well, yeah, but the big thing you have to get your head around, and this is something that took me a long time to uh, realise, that these things can't, the Loch Ness monster can't be seen in isolation. Mm. Um, there are the, these things have been reported not just from across various lakes in Britain and Ireland, but all across the Northern Hemisphere, mm. across uh, Northern Europe, Northern Asia, Siberia, North America. And these things are reported right across. And when you start looking at them, when you start uh, looking at them as part of a global phenomenon rather than as a purely localised one, then your whole views of what they are have to change. Mm. Um, something that uh, popped up recently, uh, Jonathan, only yesterday, uh, speaking of, well, real animals and uh, things that are well documented, uh, mm-hmm. was, was a rather, well, I'm, I'm not very fond of them, it was, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, the, the three-foot rat. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the pictures, I think it's almost certainly a koipo. 
Oh, gosh. Oh. What does that mean? What's that? A coipu is a type of large rodent from South America, ah. which was introduced into various parts of the UK and Ireland, ah. uh, best part of a century ago, for fur... Uh, so fur the fur trade, and they escaped from fur farms and became naturalised. Aha! Uh-huh. Uh, that makes sense because I, I mean I was trying to figure it out. Why would rats grow so huge? But if mm. they were brought brought into the country, yeah, yeah, it's not it's not actually a rat at all. It's something. It's a uh, fairly closely related animal that we know lived here up until fairly recently. The British government spent millions of pounds trying to eradicate them, and I think this is proof that. Once again, governments don't do what they say they're going to do. Yeah. Uh, how many of them do you think would be knocking around the UK at the moment, those particular giant rats? I don't know. Um, I personally think uh, probably a viable be breeding mm. population of them still. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to wipe out a species yeah. once it's become mm. established. Espe- especially of rat. Well, rodents are the most successful uh, successful mammals on the planet. I think mm. well over half of the mammal species on the planet are are rodents, and they are found yeah. all over the globe. Well, so, yeah. yeah, they are very successful. Feel free to correct me, because I'm sure I've got it wrong, but I think the rats breed at six months, and they can have up to 900 ch- children or something, can they? Or am I completely wrong? Maybe in a lifetime. Uh, sure. In a lifetime. To yeah. be quite... I've heard figures like that. You're 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 broadly right. Anyway, I don't yeah. know, I don't know the actual yeah. figures. I'm just I'm just wondering if these giant fellows are breeding like that. Wow! Oh, oh my god! <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, oh, you, um, you could have quite a large population in very little time. A, a, a large in every way. Yeah. There, yeah. If anybody's interested to see this um, thing that we called a rat. Um, Jonathan will correct me on the name again. It's uh, it's on our website actually, alternativefutureradio.com under videos. There's a there's a video there of it was in northeast England, this particular one. I remember seeing one in Leeds or Halifax or somewhere else yeah. in the north, uh, very similar to this, also reported as a as a mutant rat. Um I'm just actually on, I'm just on the internet now. I'm getting to see the picture. Because the only picture I saw was a very blurry one. Yes. Ah, yeah, there's a video. If you, if you look on I our saw... website there, you can see... Um... Yes, I think that's a koi poo. Ah, right. A koi koi Yeah, I'm poo, actually showing, yeah. having a look at the video now. Uh, I believe that's a koi poo. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised, uh, Jonathan, because we spoke recently to Paul Westwood of the... Uh, what is it? Big... Big Cat Monitors. And he was telling us about these uh, canned hunting parties, wasn't it? Yeah. Where they, uh, they bring uh, wild cats, Exotic animals. Exotic yeah. animals into the UK to hunt them. Yeah, I think that's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. It is, yeah. I think that's... A... Absolutely horrifying. Uh, but yes, I do believe that goes on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What, what else have we got uh, going on in this quarter of the world? I mean, everybody's heard of the Loch Ness Monster. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit more, what your, what your ideas are or your, uh, your thoughts well, yeah, on that. Um, the, thing that, the thing you have to think is that everything that is popularly believed about the Loch Ness Monster is wrong. It's a bit like everything that's popularly believed about the Yeti is wrong. Right. The, um, the Yeti, for example, it's not abominable. It's not a snow, it doesn't live in the snow. It's mm. not a man. So the name Abominable Snowman is completely wrong. Yeah. And with the Loch Ness mm. Monster, it's popularly thought that it is a long-necked prehistoric reptile called a, called a plesiosaur, but it can't be. That's nonsense. Mm. For example, I'll just give you one list of reasons why it can't be. Yeah. One, these things were air breathers, and right. when they do sonar sweeps of the lake, they would, if there was a large air bre- population of large air breathing animals in there, you would see the sonar, r- the sonar readings yeah. of the air in their lungs. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Two, they would come onto land to b- breed, and although there are a very mm-hmm. few reports of the Loch Ness monster on land. Uh, there are just not enough to explain there being a yeah. uh, population of mammals, animals that have to come onto land to breed. Mm. Three, if they're air-breathing animals, they have to come up to breathe. Yeah. And I don't know, if, have you ever been to Loch Ness? I've not been to Loch Ness. I've been to Windermere and a few of the other big locks there. Uh, I went to Loch Ness, I've been a couple of times, and both times I've, never, I've not ever been in the holiday season, but I've been... 
uh, once in November and once in April. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the April time, I drove all the way around and I saw 380 cars with right. people with binoculars sat in laybys <laughs> watching. Things. Yeah. And I bet you during the summer, it is probably five times that. Yeah, yeah. And yes, you have two or three sightings a year of this thing with 1,500 people a day during the summer months scanning the yeah. surface of the lot. Doesn't add up, a hell does of it? a lot more sightings if there was something coming up to, to breathe. Yeah. So what is it? We're left with something that's not an air breather, doesn't come onto land. You're not an air breather, doesn't come onto land. Mm -hmm. And, oh, the other great thing is, as well, the uh, le the lake was frozen solid in the last ice age. Yeah. So I think we can forget about a prehistoric survivor. True. But there are, um, there are enough sightings of things in the Scottish locks to suggest that there is some sort of phenomenon at mm. work. Now, what I think it is, because it doesn't come onto land, it doesn't breathe air, we're looking at a fish. We're mm -hmm. looking at a damn great big fish, and there are... The most obvious um, candidate for that in the fish known to live in Britain mm -hmm. is the common eel. Yeah. Now, the weird thing about eels, eels have been of commercial use to mankind for thousands of years, but we know very little about them. Mm. i tell you what, just a quickie for you. When do you think it was we found out where the European eel, how the European eel breeds? You know, we've been fishing it, we've been hunting it, we've been eating it for 10,000 years. Oh, I you know, know this is going to be embarrassing. It's going to be like 1995, yeah. isn't it? Uh, not quite that bad. It was 1942. Yeah. But the Pacific eels was actually 2006. Wow. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. Now, the Atlantic eels, what happens, they go down, They when they reach sexual maturity, they go down to the sea and they swim down to the Sargasso Sea in the South Atlantic. Mm -hmm. The Pacific eels do the same thing, but they swim to the Marianas Trench off the Philippines. Wow. But um, the Atlantic eels go down to the Sargasso Sea where they breed, where they spawn, they mate, they spawn, they die, and little and the eggs hatch into little things called leptocephali, which are about the size of my little fingernail, mm. which swim back up in the Atlantic. As soon as they get in the coastal waters, they turn into tiny little eels called elvers, swim right. up the um, swim up the rivers again and go back to the lakes and ponds where Mm -hmm. uh, they live until sexual maturity and the whole thing starts again. But once in a mm -hmm. while, we believe that you get an eel that's born sterile mm -hmm. and so it doesn't reach sexual maturity. It doesn't have the biological imperative to go down to the sea to met, mate and to breed. It stays in fresh water, carries on eating, carries on getting bigger. Uh -huh. And the biggest known specimens of the European eel are just a fraction over four foot, four foot one and a quarter inches, I believe. But I think it is quite possible to imagine an eel of 10 or 12 foot living mm. one, only one or two in a generation. I know that sounds like Buffy yeah. the Vampire Slayer, yeah. but only one or two in a generation because they don't breed. Yeah. Um, in the big bodies of water where there are um, monsters reported, that's what I think they are. I once caught a conger eel. It was six feet long. And it actually bit a friend of mine. He was actually washing... We'd been fishing for mackerel. He was washing his hands in a little rock pool at the side of the sea. And something jumped out of the water and bit him because he'd got blood on his hands. He thought it was a wounded fish, I assume. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm having this. And, uh, well, I ate it, to be honest. But um, it, we, it, yeah, They it, taste good, don't they? Yeah, they're pretty good. They taste like a, a, a slightly fishy cod, but they're, okay. they're, they're meaty. Um, but yeah, nice. that was six foot long, and, and that's that's big. It, it was chunky. I mean, I was fighting with it. A fisherman had to come off one of the trawlers and help me kill it. It was big. Well, if you can imagine one twice that size, mm. I don't think you need to hypothesize a Jurassic Park for this. I mean, yeah. you, that is one pretty mm. good monster. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And it's a good explanation as well as to what yeah. it could be. It's a bit more grounded, certainly, isn't it, than than a um, than a dinosaur that can hold its breath for fifty thousand years. Well, speaking well. We, 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 yeah, get used to it, guys. There are <laughs> no dinosaurs. In uh, but apart from the ones that evolved into birds, all the, the big dinosaurs, mm. all the giant reptiles, they died out 65 million years ago. Yeah. Get used to it. And, and, and that is true, is it? I'm always uh, qu quoting that. I'm always saying that, that we keep chickens, both of us. I'm yeah. always saying that, that, that they're the uh, dinosaurs of today. They're, they're, like, they're related to the T-Rex, I think. Uh, is that true, Jonathan? Chickens are outstanding. They're wonderful things. Yeah. But yes, they are evolved theropod dinosaurs. My God. Yeah, they look, they look like and, dinosaurs. And they look like dinosaurs. They really do. They run like T-Rex on Jurassic yeah. Park. <laughs> and they eat grapes. Mine are hot. 
the yeah, I've got two chickens and they hop up and down and oh. they're just about to be fed. They hop up and down very excitedly. <laughs> <laughs> so what else have we got uh, going on in this quarter before we go a bit further? What I mean, you mentioned the owl man thing, but you said that that's not necessarily um, the owl man is, a creature. The owl man is something paranormal. I'd like right. to hear John. But I tell you what, I'll give you a really nasty monster. Oh, okay. There's one again. Yes, I please. Think I've got a good, um, what's the word, a good r- rational explanation. For. Okay. Yeah. Now, up in parts of Scotland, there are accounts of vile creatures called the earth hounds, which oh. are supposed to live in the ground and f- live in graveyards and feed off freshly buried human corpses. Da, oh. da, 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 da. Oh. Yeah. And then you think this is a real big hammer house of horror. Yeah. Yep. And when you edit this, I'm sure you can put on big. Um, yeah, exactly. We, we will, <laughs> definitely. Oh, yeah. Please do for me. Um, <laughs> Now, evolution, I believe, works faster than some people think it does. Mm-hmm. But still, there have only been people burying human bodies in those uh, in that those uh, pieces of ground for a couple of thousand years at most. Yeah, you know, the churches in Scotland were only built in the fourth of. Uh, only started to be built in the fourth or fifth century, and so th- those those places have not been graveyards for very long, yeah. and they haven't been graveyards long enough for something to evolve to fill that ecological niche. Yeah, but there are an awful lot of sightings of this these things now, up in really the northernest northernest part of Scotland in Sutherland, there were up until the early twentieth century a type of polecat, a subspecies of polecat uh, called the Sutherland polecat. It's yeah. now extinct, but it was the smallest species of polecat, mm. and it lived underground, where it mostly ate on moles. Oh, and you know we know that existed, it just is allegedly extinct. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's still there. It's just so few people live up there; nobody's been up to look for them for years. Yeah, but. I think it's quite likely that a species of mustelid, something in the weasel, badger, otter, mm. polecat, yep. stoat family, has evolved to live underground eating moles. And the only people who ever see it are the only people who are stupid enough to dig in rocky ground up in that part of Scotland are the grave diggers. So the yeah. only people who ever see it <laughs> people dig deep enough are the grave diggers. You're right. Yeah. And I think these earth hounds are an unknown species from the polecat and weasel family. Mm. And again, it's something that is a perfectly natural animal yes. which yep. we have then given this big myth- yep. mythologized notion of it being a monster when it's no such thing. Mm. I think I saw a polecat once. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's very good. Uh, Jonathan, well, we'll tackle you then on uh, Bigfoot. Blimey. E- explain that one. What's Bigfoot? that all about? Or... Well, I've got a big beak. <laughs> 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 now, up until fairly recently, up until about 10 years ago, I really didn't believe in Bigfoot. Yeah. I've always believed in the Yeti because there's every reason for the Yeti. There's quite a few reasons why there isn't. And a there's a difference between Yeti and Bigfoot, uh, Jonathan. Geographical. Geographical. In that okay. Bigfoot is reported from North America, the Yeti mm-hmm. is reported from Central Asia. Okay. Now, up until very very recently in geological terms there was an animal in central asia called gigantopithecus which was a upright walking ape which was a which was about nine foot tall bloody great thing Huge. related to the orangutan right now the thing is that its bones have been found alongside all sorts of creatures that are still there today creatures like the, like the clouded leopard and the mm-hmm. giant panda and the oh. Asian water monitor, and all these other animals which are still around. And extinctions happen for a reason. Mm-hmm. Animals don't just become extinct. There's a, there is a ecological pressure on them, forces the species into extinction. Mm. And as all the other animals which were found alongside this creature are still around, I see no reason why an evolved descendant of Gigantopithecus still doesn't live in the parts of Central Asia where the Yeti has been reported. Mm. But in North America, the only record of prehistoric primates that there are are humans. Mm. Where the only There are no monkeys, there are no apes in North America. Mm. Right. Okay? And as far as I can, we can tell from the fossil record, there never have been. And so up until about 10 years ago, I really had problems with Bigfoot. I didn't yeah. believe in it. In North but America. I yeah. wonder if it's a mate of mine in Texas. And there's a chap I'd been 
corresponding by email with for some years and i got my mate to fix up a meeting with him and i was a little bit i was a little bit worried because there's me comes over from england i got long hair a leather jacket wild <laughs> staring eyes and i thought that this guy that i was just going to meet i thought he was a retired i thought he was a sort of retired college professor okay. he wrote very sort of neatly and politely <laughs> but then there's a knock on my mate's house door and this guy comes in and this guy's tall and thin got hair twice as long as mine <laughs> and the t-shirt said something incredibly rude which i can't say <laughs> on the air. I, thought, I like this man he's you know he's one of us yeah <laughs> and he took us out into the swamps in a place called orange county which is fairly near houston right and i'd always thought the texas was this big flat place you know yeah. where uh, you had oil wells, the occasional bison, some cowboys chasing some Indians, and maybe George Bush. Yeah. <laughs> but you got these damn great big swamps. Of, oh. This area of swamps are about twice the size of Devonshire. Didn't enormous. know that. Didn't know that. Swamps and he in took there. us up. He took me into these swamps, and he showed me. He showed me footprints that he'd taken of what appear to be their giant feet. Yeah. And he he reckoned the giant bare feet twice the size of mine and i've got one of them in my collection here and he showed me the photographs he'd taken he showed me uh pictures he'd taken with a thermal imaging camera Jeez. which appear to show these giant figures in in deep in the forest wow. wow and so yeah these things do exist what they are i don't know the 50 million dollar question is are they some sort of ape or are they some sort of human i imagine the which safe money is on some kind of primate i, I imagine is it well, we're, we're some kind of primate. Well, it's not, going yeah. to be either an ape or a human. Yeah. And whatever it turns out to be, it's going to open one hell of a can of worms for the American government. And mm. it'll be very interesting to see what they do. Oh, well, you speak, speaking of America, um, one of the clips I watched of you, Jonathan, it was very enjoyable. You seem to uh, make a program for the Sci Fi Channel there in the US, uh, tracking down Chubacabra. How did you get involved in that? Oh, that was in that was actually in Puerto Rico. Which, ah. if you speak to most of the people on the island of Puerto Rico and call them Americans, you'll probably get a, you'll probably get a banana knife between your yeah. ribs because they do not like being Americans. They are very fiercely proud of being who they are. But uh, <laughs> I think we've already I've, ascertained that Basil's geography is not his strong point. <laughs> oh, never mind. Never oh, but the, the, pro the program was made by the Sci Fi either. Channel yeah. in, in, in the US, but he traveled to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. I understand <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've been there twice. I went there with UK Channel 4 in 1997 ah. and with the Sci Fi Channel again in 2004. Yes. And the first time around, I, uh, 1997, yes. um, about six months before, no. 1998 it was. Yes. And when I was first approached in the summer of 1997, I had no job and no money. And I was living in bachelor squalor, in <laughs> bachelor squalor with my mate Graham in this um, crappy little house in, the, in a mid-terrace mid in, in, mid in a little housing estate in Exeter. And this bloke comes up, so this bloke phones, up, phones me up and says, do you want to go next winter? Do you want to go and spend three weeks in Mexico and Puerto Rico? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and of course I said, no, I'd rather stay, I'd rather stay on the dole. With, I'd rather stay on the dole in England. Than yeah, in I mean, clearly. Well, it's a no-brainer. What do you think? I, so I said, yeah. And we went out and I spent three weeks out there and I made what I think was a quite an entertaining documentary mm. and i came back convinced that there was something very real uh, to investigate and then when the sci-fi channel appro approached me again in 2004 i went yes. back for the second time i've written a couple of books about it and i think that an awful lot of what they say about the chupacabra it's another one of these things everything you think you know is wrong there is you know the stories are of this bipedal creature semi-bipedal creature with spikes down its back uh, attacking domestic livestock and drinking yes. their blood. Well, this just isn't true. Mm. There are, there is something attacking the domestic livestock and drinking its blood. That's true. Yeah. Okay. There are sightings of this weird, spiky-looking creature. Do you think? What, what do you think it is? Put two and two together, and they make six. And that's just not that's just just not the way the universe works. Mm. What I believe it is is that there's an unknown species of rodent, something allied to the porcupines, that um, it lives in these high grassland plateaus and canavanas in Puerto Rico. Mm. That's the thing. The, that's the things with the spiky 
things, the spikes on its back. And these are mostly vegetarian. And the biggest thing they eat is plantains and bananas. And I've seen the trees that they've destroyed eating the um, cutting down and eating, eating banana trees. There was enough evidence to suggest that there was an unknown species of um, large rodent living there. But then you're still left with the uh, blood-sucking creature. The, you're still left with the exsanguinated corpses of domestic livestock. Mm. And I'd always... I'd been sort of... Um, I'd been led down a blind alley because by the name Chupacabra, which means the goat sucker. That's right. Because I've heard all these accounts of these things attacking uh, sheep and goats, but particularly goats. Yeah. And it wasn't until I, my second trip there when I actually went up into the mountains and I saw the indigenous goats of that part of Puerto Rico. They're tiny. They're smaller than pygmy goats you ah. get in England. And I saw a photograph of a peacock that had been attacked. And as soon as I saw the triangular piece of bone missing out of the top of the skull, I knew exactly what it was that had caused, caused the killings. And what had mm. almost certainly caused all the killings where blood had been sucked out of the bodies for the last 10 years. It was a mongoose. Now, right. mongooses are only found in Africa and Asia. But it turned out in the 1880s, somebody, some bright spark, had introduced mongooses yes. to Puerto Rico to try and keep down the rat population. Yeah. Probably the Victorians. Still there. <laughs> Sorry? Probably the Victorians. They did all that kind of crazy stuff. Uh, yes, except in this case, it wasn't the Victorian British, it was the Victorian Americans. Right. Who were even more stupid than the Victorian <laughs> Well, at least it wasn't our fault for once. <laughs> well, at least we got an empire out of it. They just got McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say things like that, am I? Sorry. Oh, no. Moving well, swiftly up. You can say anything on this show. Uh, no, uh, as you may have guessed. <laughs> no, I, don't think you, I don't think you should test me on that. Um, no. Now, Jonathan, God willing, my geography will hold up on this question <laughs> because I haven't done very well so far today. And we're, we're in America. I am definitely in America this time. Right. And there was this strange creature who washed up on the shore, the Montauk Beast. I think if oh, you... Oh, dear Lord. The Montauk monster. Yes. Yeah. Now, that one, this is something that makes me cross. Okay. Because this damn thing got washed up on the beach. Somebody sent me and my colleague, Richard Freeman, a picture of it. Yes. We took one look at it. It said, it's a small carnivore that's been in the sea for a long time, and the fur has rotted off. Okay. When, uh, Richard thought it was a cat. I thought it was a, a skunk. Skunk. And that ah. was it. So I, I just sent one email back and forgot about it. Within a week, it was the biggest news story on the planet. That's right. And, and idiots all over the world have been coming out with the wonderful stories about how it was the secret American... <laughs> you, American you might be talking to one of yeah. those idiots. You, you may be talking to one of the idiots. <laughs> uh, guys, guys, no. Not no, me. Idiot. Look at that. <laughs> no, honestly, guys, it's a dead raccoon. I mean, <laughs> I've even got a letter from the bloke who put it there? It was a bunch of stone oh. surfers found a dead <laughs> raccoon and a, kid's, and a kid's rubber raft and decided to give the dead raccoon a Viking burial. So they put it with a load of stuff, including some suspiciously <laughs> long cigarettes, onto this rubber raft, set fire to it, and sent it out to sea. It burned all the hair off and it came back. It's a bad practical joke by a bunch of stone surfers. <laughs> well, That's what, classic. What a shame. It was so near the CDC centre in Plum Island. Yeah, right? you, you've been on about that for for a couple uh, of weeks. Jesse Ventura made a program about it. I'm absolutely... Yeah, but he's as mad as a box of snakes. I'm gobsmacked now. I think I'll have to drop that one off my mystery list. Thanks, I Jonathan. I think you should. <laughs> and if you want to know about Plum Island, there's a really, really good novel by Nelson DeMille called Plum Island, which I really recommend. It's a really good story. Well, uh, you, can, you, you can debunk... Okay, moving swiftly on. You can yeah. de debunk me again, then. Is it the birthplace of Lyme's disease? Oh, yeah, my best. Lyme, uh, Lyme, I heard a connection Sorry? with, with uh, Lyme's disease and Plum Island. Have you heard about that? Uh, no, I don't know anything about no, that. No, because it's just no. nonsense. <laughs> no, you're just making this up. Probably. I am, yeah. I'll, Repeating anything you hear on reading. I'll let you carry on, Mark. We're moving on. Yeah, let's well, get... Well, there's, there's a friend of mine who's writing a book about the connections in UFOs and the JFK assassination. Oh. And I told him it wow. should be called, Oh, my God, they've killed Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. Now, I've got a list of animals here that I've heard you mention. Uh, I don't know how serious some of them are, but I've heard you mention them on your videos. So, uh, what is a Nandi bear? It sounds cute. 
Uh, Anandi bear was a creature which was reported in parts of Kenya up around, uh, from the, up until the early part of the 20th century. There have been sporadic reports from other places in Africa which people have uh, claimed may or may not be a Nandi bear intermittent ever since. The interesting thing was that this creature was supposed to be, just like the name implies, a bear. And there has only ever been one bear known from the African continent. Mm. And this is it's probably extinct. It's in the High Atlas, and it's a bear. It's a subspecies of the Eurasian brown bear, which is found in Morocco. But um, this thing looked like a bear. And the smart money is that it's actually also it's actually at least three different creatures which people had. Again, seen seen in the half light, seen out the corner of their eyes, and mm-hmm. thought that they were all the same thing. Um, do you know what a rattel is? A rattel, a honey badger. I've never heard of that one. No, I've heard of honey badger. All right. Now this is quite cool, because you know, then these turned up in southern Iraq a few years ago, and again people said it was Saddam Hussein's genetic sperm <laughs> snakes. But look it up, and look it up online. When you R-A-T-E-L. say people specifically, we it's mean Basil. A, it's a large and fairly. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, it was Basil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Down to you. <laughs> come on, Basil, you should know better. And I shall have more sense. <laughs> yeah, come on, Basil. I think we need to have these headlines. Basil does it again. <laughs> yeah, Basil was claiming that these that these creatures had turned up from southern Iraq. Yeah, I were, remember that. <laughs> um, escapees from Saddam Hussein's genetic laboratories. Yeah. Well, we know Saddam Hussein didn't have weapons of mass destruction. I bet he didn't have genetic laboratories either. That's a guess now. And these ratels live across parts across a lot of southern asia and parts of africa and it's been suggested that particularly large ratels could be some of the nandi bear sightings it's also been suggested that it could be a unknown species of particularly large baboon and it's also been suggested that it was a weird type of supposedly extinct prehistoric ungulate called a chalicothere, which were weird things, because although they were ungulates, like horses, they mm. had claws and walked semi-bipedally. Really, really weird-looking creatures. Yeah. Wow. Um, so and what, what do you want to know about next, Basil? I think <laughs> I'll let Mark take it from here, Jonathan, before I disgrace myself before anymore. Before you embarrass yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, now, I've got a little list here. Um, now, this one I've heard you talk about a good bit. Um, an orang pendek, if I say that right. Well, the Orang Pendek, which is the little man of the forests, is one of the cryptids that is most likely to exist. We've been out looking for it on four occasions now. My friend Richard Freeman's uh, gone out on four expeditions to the jungles of Sumatra looking for what appears to be a little upright walking ape which mm-hmm. he believes in his book, Orang Pendek, which is available from all good booksellers, folks. Yep. Um, he believes is a new, either a new species or a new subspecies of orangutan that, for some, that walks upright rather than stays in the trees. Fantastic mm-hmm. creature. We've got footprints. We've had hair. We brought hair back in 2009, and we did manage to extract some DNA from it, which was similar but not equal to an orangutan. But ah. It was too degraded to be able to get a definitive uh, definitive identification. But it is certain that there's something out there, and I'd like to think it's going to be us, the guys who find it. Hmm. Uh, I was watching a video recently, uh, Jonathan, of the top 10 cross species. And this is a thing where they would cross a, a tiger and a lion or a bison and a cow and the, or a donkey and a horse. Uh, mm. Why do they... Was, di- was it Basil who showed you this? No, it's me. It's me. It's Basil <laughs> no, he's speaking. he's talking uh, to himself I'm at talk- this stage. Um, why why yeah. do they do that? Why would they cross a lion and a tiger? And who's doing it? What, what's that about? Uh... The answer is I don't know why people do this stuff. Yeah. Probably like climbing Mount Everest because they can. Yeah. I don't know. It, uh, it always seems pretty stupid to yeah, me. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's strange. Because you can crossbreed things, but um, all it does is dilutes the genetic purity of a species and produces a freak. I, yeah. I really don't see any point. I'd like to ca- cross a cat and a dog. It'll just rip itself to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> 
no answer to that. <laughs> oh, I'm just joining in. Um, <coughs> right, yeah, uh, right, one well, more. Well, or you could cross a politician with a small pig, and you might get a politician with half a brain. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say you might get a bigger pig. but <laughs> might get a bigger brain in <laughs> <Yeah>. a politician. <laughs> a really smart pig. Um, no, really, no, no, the other way around. A really <laughs> smart politician. <laughs> Okay, delete what I said about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we'll um, skip over that. I've got one question for you, which uh, which I was desperate to ask, and that is, all of these um, animals, unknown animals, there, there are, there's a great big list of these things, that have, and I imagine they've been going on for quite some time. Have any of these animals, which have been known to be an unknown animal, ever been gone on to, to, to actually be discovered, to be to be accepted by science and documented? Has it has anything made the transition from cryptozoology to zoology? Would have been the smarter way to say that question. Well, yeah. What the best description, the best one of the lot, that's the giant squid. Ah, yes. Because um, if you look at the maps, of, if you look at the maps of the medieval and later mariners, you see these heavy monsters and you yep. see pictures of fearsome looking creatures. And you hear in, in the books and the folklore, you hear the stories about the kraken, some, an animal oh, yes. big enough yep. that it came up to land, it uh, came up onto the surface of the water. People actually thought it was an island. And these things were thought to be pure myth mm. until the mid 19th century when one got found. Mm-hmm. And there was a, in, I think it was 19, there were travellers' tales up until 1912 of there being dragons on three little islands in the Sunda Straits in Indonesia, yep. one of them being the island of Komodo. And it wasn't uh -huh. until, I think, <laughs> believe in it, I believe a pilot crash-landed there. And suddenly they found that there was a big, you know, the world's biggest or the world's bulkiest lizard there. Yeah. And the other, the other ones, the mountain gorilla, Mountain gorilla was known as this fearsome creature, which would fearsome creature which would come down from the forest and abduct ab abduct women and abduct women and kill people and do all sorts of horrible things. Until um, relatively recently, it was found the shyest and largest and most intelligent of the gorillas and a gorgeous creature. So yeah, these things yeah. do get found. These things get found quite regularly. That's good. Yeah. I meant to ask you. Um, I meant to ask Next you there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I meant I'm to ask you. I'm enjoying myself, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I meant to ask you there um, about your uh, current investigations because you mentioned there that you have been out doing various bits of field research and uh, and we did mention in your introduction that your your organisation is is not really a spectator sport. People can actually get involved, can't they? Yeah, I mean, I very much dislike the sort of organisation which has a big flashy website and puts out magazines and says, hey, look at us, we're so clever. I'm familiar we with say, that website. We say, look at us, we're doing our best. If you guys think you can do better, come and help us. Come and help us. And pretty well everybody who's involved, because the CFZ when it started was me, my first wife, and a bloke called Dave. And now there's hundreds ah. of people all over the place. <laughs> Why is there always everybody a Dave? Everybody involved started yeah. off as a, you know... I haven't seen Dave in years. My ex-wife and I haven't spoken to each other in 16 years. <laughs> but everybody else involved is, um, you know, our volunteers who've come in from nowhere and have become part of the scene, part of what's happening. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you doing um, the weird weekends uh, this year, Jonathan, or anything like that? Have you? Are you doing any oh, talks? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Okay. This, this year, it's our 13th year. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember who's... I've now got... For the life of me, I can't remember who our speakers are this year. It's the third weekend in August, as um, as always. Uh, the mm -hmm. speakers are, blimey, this is speak amongst yourselves. I'm just trying to get yeah. my list. Yeah, well, I think I remember. I'm trying to remember don't, some of them uh, myself. Don't, don't, don't I know that. I know that you're a good Talk self. You're, you're the you're the uh, keynote speaker there. I, I believe you're you're giving uh, some kind of talk there as well. I'm looking on yeah, my. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, yeah. We got. Richard Freeman, 20 cryptids you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. Richard Muirhead, the flying snake of Namibia. And Richard Thorns, the search for the pink-headed duck. On Friday, we've got three Richards. That's peculiar. That's good. Yeah. We've got a guy Light called buses. Nick Bottom, who's an insect expert. We have a talk by a guy called Lars Thomas on the, mystery, on the cryptozoology of Denmark. We've got a guy called Kevin Goodman who's asking the question, with people having blind belief in UFOs and aliens, has ufology become a new religion? 
We've got uh, a guy called Glenn Vaudry talking about Scottish sea monster carcasses. There's quite a few of them. There's a surprisingly number. There's a guy called Jan Bonderson, who's a doctor from South Wales. He's Swedish, but he lives in South Wales. He's talking about the Victorian story of Greyfriars Bobby, the dog that, when its master died, went and spent the next X number of years staying on guard in the master's grave. I've heard we of have that. Richard's um, expedition report on the Sumatra 2011. Mm -hmm. We've got a guy called Paul Screeton talking about the Hexham Heads. We've got Neil Arnold talking about Mr. Animals of Kent. We've got a countryman of yours, Ronan Coghlan, talking about Sinbad the Sailor. We've got me <laughs> doing my normal <laughs> excuses for why we haven't achieved as much as I want to and asking for money. <laughs> so that is basically So your, your event, um, you may as well give it a good old plug. Uh, where can people find out more about your, your event and, and does it cost very much? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, roll up, roll up. Welcome back, my friends, to the show which never ends, the greatest 40 event of the year. It is the Weird Weekend. Ample parking in the wonderful uh, Sylvan settings of rural North Devon. It's in the community centre at Woolsery in North Devon. We've got very cheap parking. We've got cheap camping, by the way, as well as B&Bs and hotels all the way around. That's handy. It's three days. If you buy the ticket in advance, it's 20 quid. If you buy wow. it on the door, it's 25 quid. Brilliant. It's about half the price of everyone else. That's cheap. And it is the foremost cryptozoological event of the year. You gentlemen, if you fancy coming along... Yes, we do. give you guest tickets. You can come along and interview anybody you want. Oh, how could we? Oh, oh, my. Oh, my God. Ooh, well, we'd, we'd love have to, to seriously think about that. Well, we'd love to go. Um, speaking of of UFOs, um, Jonathan, if my notes aren't... Well, there's things you can bring... There's various things from Ireland that you can bring me in a bottle as payment, so... Oh, I understand. <laughs> I, uh, I can guess what that is. Um, <laughs> just, just speaking of UFOs, if my notes are, are holding up and my information is correct, which it rarely is... Yes. Um, it appears that you've, se you, you've written a book, UFOs Over Devon. No. I had to pay for my divorce somehow. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the money book. <laughs> it was the money book, is that it? No, I am, UFOs is a subject that interests Yes. Me. doesn't interest me anywhere near as much as Mystery Animals, but it does interest me. I'm actually the editor at the moment of a UFO magazine called UFO Matrix. I've just taken over as the editor. Ah. Because it interests me because although there is a real phenomenon there to be investigated 90% of what people talk about it is complete and utter nonsense yeah. and I find it both frustrating and interesting to try to delineate between the nonsense and the truth so the truth is out there, guys, but it isn't what most people expect it to be. According to our highly researched Wikipedia page on yourself, your, your best-selling book is the Owlman one, which we men mentioned earlier, which is another n sort of not really cryptozoology but yet more something paranormal. a little bit more alternative mm. yeah Owlman's by far the most popular book I've ever written I must read up more about Owlman we need we probably mean maybe we need we need to get you back on maybe just to talk about Owlman it sounds fascinating uh, what I've read of it it's very strange Oh, I'm quite happy. I'll come on anytime you want me to, guys. Uh, I'll do a bit more research, Jonathan, and you can geography do, mostly, uh, and geography, <laughs> and you can debunk me on a few more yeah, things. Yeah. You, you can if, da you can dash my hopes. If you want to humiliate him live, then yeah. you know <laughs> we could make a special well, edition I'm, I'm, of it. <laughs> I've enjoyed myself, guys. I hope I hope you guys have had fun, fun oh, as well. I've had been, a great time. Oh, it's, it's been, been fantastic. And you can uh, become a member of your organisation. Please give the website. Yeah, come along to the Centre for Fortune Zoology website. It's www.cfz.org.uk. And we've got a daily magazine, which you get linked to from the front page of the website, a daily blog magazine, which has been has lodged up over 8,000 8, articles now, and we get five or 6,000 people a day reading. So come along, come on and join us. The water's fine. And how much does it cost to join your uh, organisation? And, and is it open to international uh, members? It is open to international members, and I can't remember is the answer. Uh, <laughs> 16 quid in the UK. Great. I think it's, I think it's the same in Ireland. And yes. I think it's the same in Ireland. I think it's a couple quid more in mainland Europe. And beca that's because but, you actually um, get a magazine you, posted out to you, don't you, as well? You There's... get a magazine posted out to you, and the best thing to do, what's best for me is if you join by PayPal, because right. when people send me checks from different countries, it gets completely confusing. Yeah, yeah. 
That's brilliant. Even with everybody having Euro checks, I can't, I can't cast them in my local post office. So brilliant. the off-license won't take them. Uh, it's That's been, fine. It's, been, <laughs> it's just been so much fun talking to you today, Jonathan. I hope we can make it to Devon, Mark, because I'd love to go over and meet him in person. It would be quite cool, this. Yes, oh, it, could, wow. it could be a road trip. It could be a road trip. And the best of luck with your weekend there, yes. Jonathan. Thank you, guys. Thanks it's, for having me. Brilliant. It's, thanks it's, for, just, it's thanks been a great show. On. Thanks Thanks so much. Thanks, My Sam. name's Grump Forrest Thank Grump, and I like later. to listen to the Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio with Basil and Mark. I'm sorry for fighting at your Black Panther party. Well, that was Jonathan Downs. Wasn't uh, he great? Oh, he's fantastic. I don't think we've got very much time left today. We seem to be uh, hurtling through it. Jonathan had an awful lot to say. Yeah. All very interesting stuff. Yeah, and great explanations for these uh, mysterious creatures. Ones that are not that mysterious. It, it wasn't what I was expecting <laughs> at all. I was expecting... He them... scuppered you. I was expecting... You've been scuppered. I was expe- I've had a bad day. You've had a bad... <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't and been we a... didn't mention his cover of The Cockney Rebel. No, I was trying to get that uh, in, uh, but we didn't have time. But hopefully he'll come back on again. We'll uh, have to seriously uh, consider a road trip to well, Devon to this uh, event. I uh, think it's in June. If he didn't give the date. Last two weeks, it's on his website. Last two weeks in August, he said. Right. And it's in Devon. And, and it's very cheap. I mean, 25. 25 quid. It's nothing. For a three-day event. And it'll be cheap bed and breakfast. Cheap and camping sounds a, quite nice. A camping Camping's that, cheap. Camping we can afford. Camping um, the level that or we can afford. possibly a park bench. Park bench, which, yeah, which, whichever, is, bench whichever is most available. I did sleep on a bench next to a rat once. Wasn't great. Not a giant rat, though. N- well, it was quite big, but not giant. Not that big. No. Okay, it's been wonderful uh, today, and thank you so much for yeah. turning to Future Radio, and thank you to Jonathan Downs. Yeah, okay, so if you want to contact us, you can do. Uh, let us know your thoughts or your opinions, and if you've got any guests to suggest, or if you're listening to this and you want to be a, je- contact a guest. Contact us. You know, don't, don't be a jest, be a guest. Yeah, be a guest. That's, and and you can jest. You can, yeah. There's no law against It's just a slogan that we have, don't be a jest, be a guest. Exactly. To the Out There Hour. <laughs> With Basil. See you, everybody. You can contact us via facebook.com forward slash out there hour or youtube.com forward slash AF Radio YT or email us on helpdesk at alternativefutureradio.com. Skype us on AFR Guest. Alternativefutureradio.com. The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! Redundant. Uh, redundant and uh, quite unwell at the age of 30. I decided to spend the rest of my life doing what I actually enjoyed doing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Good, good advice to anybody, I think. Indeed, I think so. How, how did you come back from the nervous breakdown, uh, Jonathan? I mean, how did you... Uh, come right again. Oh, uh, well, some people would say I'm not right now. Um, <laughs> years of therapy, years of therapy, and well, it was just a not very nice, not a very nice period of my life. Yeah, know. yeah. I've I've been through it. I've got the I've come out the other side. It's, it sounds like you were. I think it sounds like getting back into doing things that you enjoy and that you like doing was probably a uh, part of it. Well, yeah, and. Much to my surprise, I found I actually found that I'm actually quite good at it. I'm actually quite good at being a cryptozoologist. Probably yeah. better at being a cryptozoologist than I was being a mental health nurse. So mm. it's just the way the world works out. Sometimes I think most people are probably better at their hobbies than at their work because yeah. you'd be more interested in your hobby anyway, wouldn't you? Well, you elected to uh, to do it. You're not forced into yeah. doing it like most people That's are with work, I imagine. Yeah. So cryptozoology for all the people out there who have never heard that term, because I must admit I. I knew that people studied various unusual animals, but I wasn't aware of the term until relatively recently, so I imagine there's a few other people as well who don't know. Yeah. What is cryptozoology in a, in, a, in a nutshell? In a nutshell, it is the study of animals which are not scientifically accepted, which are not known, not accepted by mainstream science. Right, right. And there are a good few of them, aren't there? There's, there's, we've got a big list of them here that we've just pulled up through through various uh, your, of your videos and things that you've commented on and we've got a big list of those that we might ask about later as well okay um I've come on that. now seriously not often do i know the lyrics to songs you know that one who doesn't know the lyrics to that one an all-time favorite yeah exactly and he also covered here comes the sun <laughs> son steve harley not jonathan yeah well we'll probably brush over that so shall we get him on 
Uh, let's go for it. Let's I think call him. I, I can't say much more about him. He's a very interesting guy, and we're yep. going to ask him a few things. We're going to ask him about his involvement uh, in America in the Sci Fi Channel, uh, tracking down Tuba Capra. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Right, let's give him a call then. Uh, where are we? Hello. Hello, Jonathan Downs. Hi, how are you? Oh, not too bad, not too bad. Um, <clears throat> this is Mark speaking. And this is Basil. Jonathan, how are you? Oh, not too bad, guys, not too bad. It's, what can I do for you It's today? wonderful to speak to you today. I'm a great fan. Thank you. Of your work. It's all very interesting stuff. Basil was just giving uh, your uh, credits and your intro and things then, and uh, even that sounded quite interesting and intriguing. Golly. So... You're going to give me a swollen head like this? Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how, how would somebody go about going from being a, a mental health professional to a cryptozoologist? That was my question, just while we were talking about you. Uh, the honest truth is I had a massive nervous breakdown oh. after 10 years working, with, um, working in mental health. Right. I went spectacularly mad and there wasn't anything else I knew how to do. Wow. That's a brilliant answer. Not many people well, start their answer spent, with, I went completely mad. <laughs> well, I spent, I spent 12 years doing what I knew was a socially valid and important thing that I, that I, needed, I needed to do, but I didn't yeah. enjoy it at all. No. And then basically, when I found myself a service officer, Ah, uh, who author? He authored several books on a wide range of subjects. He's so, lived in um, Nigeria as well, I think, in Hong Kong. And he's lived other. in Nigeria. He was brought up in Nigeria and Hong Kong on, oh. on account of his father being a. I wonder if he's got any chests of gold. I'm sure he hasn't. If we give him two thousand dollars, maybe he'll send them over. He, would, he wouldn't be on this program if he had. <laughs> yeah. So the father was a, an author. Yes. And he, he wrote books on African history, theology, and the Devonshire dialect, which probably needs a bit of examination. Blimey! If you've ever spoken to anybody from Devonshire. Aye. Uh, his mother, Mary Downs, was a broadcaster and author who published several collections of Nigerian folklore. Ah. Now, Jonathan himself is currently yeah. the editor of Animals and Men. Yep. The journal of the, the journal of the Centre of Fortean Zoology. Yeah. The ed, the editor of the, editor, the yeah. amateur naturalist, not naturist, naturalist. Yeah. Yep. Formerly exotic pets. He's the director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology as well. That's right, and a magazine published by C F Z uh, Press. Yep. Um, the online was the online ma uh, magazine blog Cryptozoology Online. Yeah. No, I mean, he's got a website as well. Now, if I can remember it correctly, see if you can remember it. Um, I think it's um, cfz.org.uk. I'll have to actually get that back from him. I'm not sure exactly what that website is. Oh, he, he worked as a psychiatric nurse between 1981 and 1990 and 1990 and 94. Uh-huh. So that's his uh, ties with uh, the... Uh, right. Yeah, yeah it, his website is cfz dot org dot uk i can come now i can now confirm and you can join it's not uh, it's not a spectator sport you can actually join in and he was also ran the the fan club for steve Har harley and the cockney rebels did he really somebody he's had got to. it all somebody had to hey eh? he's eh? got it all yeah. it's broken oh, he's every got, rule you've broken every rule yeah oh, that was brilliant so how did you um sort of get involved in cryptozoology then what what started your your journey well um back in Oh Lord, 45 years ago, 44 years ago, in the summer of 1968, I was living in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong was then a British colony. And every Thursday, my mother used to go into town to uh, go, um, play tennis with her friends, have coffee, and then she'd go to the library. And she'd bring back, uh, she'd bring back um, thrillers for my father, Color, color, picture books for my little brother and books for mm. animals for me. Ah. And one day she brought back a book called Myth or Monster, which just totally blew me away because I'd always been interested in animals, but I was totally blown away by the idea that there were people who believed that there were monsters in Loch Ness and mm. yetis in yeah. the Himalayas and things. And basically I just fell in love with it. And I went to school the next day, and the, um, the teacher did one of those things that they did in schools in those days. So, class, what are you going to be when you grow up? And, <laughs> uh, Billy, what are you going to be? And Billy said, I'm going to be a soldier, miss. 
What are you going to be, Freddy? I'm going to be a train driver, miss. What are you going to be, Jonathan? I'm going to be a monster hunter. <laughs> Back of the class, Jonathan. Weird up. And then, <laughs> she was a terrifying woman. Terrifying woman. <laughs> and I thought she was ancient. She was probably in her mid-40s. So I thought she was ancient. <laughs> um, she was a terrifying woman. She uh, got reared up to her full height and said, Mr. Downs, who I'm never going to amount to anything if you don't know your nine times table. <laughs> and that's basically the story of how I did it. I thought, then, right, screw you, I'm going to well, do this anyway. You, you, and that's basically why I did. You, you'd think they'd be used to uh, strange creatures in Japan with Godzilla and everything, wouldn't you, Jonathan? Japan? Japan. Oh, oh sorry, were, were you... Uh, uh, were... Oh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Out There Hour. It's nice, it's warm, it's cuddly. Give us a cuddle. The Out There Hour on Alternative Future Radio. The Out There Hour with Basil and Mark. www.alternativefutureradio.com Yay! Yay! In your face, everybody else. Good morning, Kuwait. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Kuwait. <laughs> and the Middle East. <laughs> Good morning, the Middle East generally. Good morning, Israel. We've got a lot of people on from Israel. Yeah. It's very strange. It's going to be a great show today. We've got a fantastic show today with a top guest, world-renowned guest. We don't get to say that often. No, not too often. Who is he? What's he up to? What does he do? Tell us everything, Basil. You know all. His name is Jonathan Downs. Yes. He's a cryptozoologist. What's a cryptozoologist? Cryptozoologist is somebody who investigates mysterious animals. I imagine that's the crypto part. That's the crypto part, and it could be something like uh, it could be something like Bigfoot, Chupacabra, the Loch Ness monster. Yes. Um, some other weird stuff you might have heard of, like a uh, Mothman. Ooh, I didn't a- know that was actually and, uh, a real thing. An Owlman. Owlman, I want to ask him about well, that. Mothman, I only heard of that today. Mothman is a is a a, a, a man sized moth creature who has been reported all over the world. Ah, we'll have to ask him about that. He's a cryptozoologist, he's an yep. author, he's a filmmaker, he's a journalist. He's written a lot of books, hasn't he? Composer, singer-songwriter, with a background in radical politics and mental health care. Not surprised. I, I read that and thought, what <laughs> does that mean? Well, he's got a background in mental health, he's worked with the mentally ill. Yeah, uh, background in radical politics, how does that tie in with cryptozoology? We'll have to ask him. We'll have to find out. Yeah. Um, oh, his um, his father was an explorer and a colonial.